Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nick McPhee. And sadly, the screen over on this side isn't working, so we'll have to like be over on this side as much as we can. Um, uh, and I'm going to give a talk on learning hard things on Twitch um, and depending on the kindness of strangers. Um, so who am I? I'm Nick McPhee. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota Morris. Morris, yeah, which there's a lot of Morris people here, so apologies if they're poorly behaved. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. There's a lot of alum, great alums here, um, and thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, so Morris is the public liberal arts campus of the University of Minnesota, uh, about 1,000, 1,400 students um, in a t the town of Morris, which is about 5,000 people, three hours west of here in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, not long ago it was snowing like that. Yesterday it snowed again because this spring will not ever show up. Yeah, it was nearly eighty. What two weeks ago? Uh, oh! Coping poorly. Um, so uh, I teach computer science, um, and a lot of these. Uh, random Morris people or computer science major uh, alumni, um, which is very cool. Uh, and it does sometimes get warm and trees have leaves and things like that happen in Morris as well. Um, because this is mini bar, you should all feel free to get up and leave, right? That's part of the point of the game. So I'm going to try to give you the two slide version of today. And if at the end of that you're like, not really my gig, feel free to bug out. That's totally fine. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, so the super short version, I'm near the end of a sabbatical year, um, spent it in Morris in our house instead of out working with a research group somewhere else, which is what I've normally done in the past. And I wanted to use that opportunity to learn something new that turned out to be the Rust programming language, which we can talk about if you want to. Um, and I had several concerns about how to make that work. How do I stay focused? I'm, I'm human, the internet's full of distracting things, yada yada. How do I keep myself accountable and actually get work done? And how do I get help when I'm stuck, okay? And so as an experiment, which is now still ongoing, um, I tried live programming on the internet because isn't that what people do, I guess? I don't know, it's a very strange world we live in. Um, and it worked, it worked really well. Um, I met some very cool people. Um, and uh, it gave me focus, like it gave me several hours a week where I was absolutely focused on the task at hand. It gave me accountability because I knew there were people that were expecting me to show up and get stuff done. Um, and they provided an enormous amount of help. I, that part is just really hard to overstate um, and how wonderful and valuable those people were. Um, just so you know, this is actually being live streamed on Twitch right now to the people that would normally come and watch me program. Um, so uh, we're on the internet at the moment. And if that concerns you, because if you ask a question, you might get your audio might get heard by people in Europe or something, um, you should know that that's happening and feel free to act accordingly. Okay? That QR code will be repeated at the end. Um, if you're so inclined. But if you want to watch us on your phone, you can. We're here. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the too long didn't stay. Um, if you want to race out now, good time to do it. Um, otherwise, here's the outline for the rest of the talk. Um, I'll provide a little bit more of the context. Um, I'll talk about what I was trying to accomplish, uh, what I actually got done, how's it gone, um, advantages and privileges, it's gone well for me, but I don't think that's just a guaranteed outcome, and, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we can talk about, like, like, you could do this if you wanted to. It really wasn't hard. It just, you know, it worked. Um, and then I'm going to try to keep this to sort of half an hour-ish so that we have 10, 15 minutes at the end. Uh, to talk about what you're interested in. Like, do we want to talk about Rust? Do you want to talk about streaming? Do you want to just leave for lunch, right? So I'm going to try to keep my part a little short, 
um, and, and give us some time to let the audience sort of drive what happens, again, kind of in the spirit of minibar. Um, so uh, <coughs> while there is the Q&A at the end, I am happy to take questions at any point during the talk. So don't be shy. Um, you know, I'm used to people shouting in their, you know, while in mid-sentence, several of these people have done it. Um, so context. I'm a faculty member at the Morris campus, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da, I'm on sabbatical. Uh, I've taught computing now for a little over 30 years. And oddly enough, things have changed a little bit in those 30 years, okay? Um, almost nothing specific that I teach in terms of like languages and libraries, almost none of that existed when I started teaching, right? It wasn't even that it was new then, it didn't even exist then. Um, and, you know, there are concepts that have aged very well. Quicksort is still cool um, and hopefully will be for a long time, but uh, a lot of this other stuff has changed very fast. Keeping up is hard, okay? And if you work in the field, in industry, you know that pain too, right? That, that keeping up in, in uh, computing is a real challenge. Um, I've done various things to try to help keep up. Um, actually, 10 years ago, uh, I worked as a summer intern uh, for a startup uh, called KidBlog, now called Fan School, that was started by two Morris alums. So I worked as their intern uh, for the summer as a way of trying to like stay on top of things in some fashion. And that was my first mini bar. Um, they were coming uh, and invite, encouraged me to come out uh, and meet with the team uh, at mini bar. And I've been a great mini bar fan ever since. Um, Sabbatical is a great way to keep up, learn new tools. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've traveled previously to Europe, a couple of different places in the UK. Uh, and Massachusetts on sabbaticals that I worked with research teams um, and that's given me accountability and structure. I'm not just sitting at home kind of figuring things out. Um, but we stayed home this time because COVID and complicated things. Um, so I wanted to learn some stuff. I'm going to be home for a year. Let's use this effectively. I want to learn some new technologies. There were a lot of choices as you can imagine. A lot of languages that I don't know or don't know as well as I'd like. Web frameworks appear to come out every afternoon just for fun. Um, and keeping up in that space is just impossible. Um, there's a lot of DevOps stuff that I would have liked to have spent time on. Um, I decided to start off by uh, learning Rust or learning more Rust. And I never actually escaped, uh, partly because <laughs> the streaming thing just worked so well. It was like, I'm still learning things and I'm still happy. And so I just kind of kept doing Rust all year. Um, so why Rust? Um, it's very popular. Uh, seventh straight year as the most wanted language in the Stack Overl Overflow Developer Survey. Um, this is the top six languages. The list goes on quite a bit longer than this. And of these six languages, I no Elixir reasonably well. I'm actually quite good at Clojure, quite good at TypeScript, quite good at Python. Don't really care about Julia. I mean, Julia is cool, but it doesn't solve any problems that I have any particular interest in. Um, Rust is something I had done a little work with and clearly seemed to be a hole that I wanted to fill in my sort of list of stuff that I know things about. Um, why? Well, part of it is that Rust solves a problem that I care about a lot, um, it, or helps solve a problem I care about a lot. So it does a lot to help solve problems with memory safety. Uh, in 2019, Microsoft announced that roughly 70% of all their security, security vulnerabilities were due to memory safety issues. I have seen, I have myself made many memory mistakes. I have watched students fall in that hole over and over again. I mean, I'm very aware of that pain. Um, like memory management? Memory management. Uh, what? Well, so, yes. So Java, so there are different ways to handle the memory problem, OK? So the, the memory problem exists primarily in like C and C++, to be honest. Like out in production, those are the languages that generate the pain. And for Microsoft, an awful lot of their stuff is in C and C++. Um, and so that's a real concern for them, right? 
If you were to use C Sharp or Java or Python or Ruby, you don't have those problems or closure, but you also then bring a whole runtime system, garbage collection, a lot of other issues. And if you're trying to write operating systems, for example, that's not really an option, um, right? And so it, it's interesting that just late last year, early this year, I think late last year, um, uh, the Linux Foundation has announce support for Rust as a tool they will accept for kernel work, okay? So uh, it, up until that point, it was just C and C++ and assembly when absolutely necessary, right? So this is a major change for them, that they're sort of taking Rust on as an option. At the moment, there's no Rust code in the Linux kernel, but they're getting the framework in place that that can be possible moving forward. So. So for those of us who are newer to this terminology, what exactly is memory safety? Great question. So in, and again, in languages where you have to manage memory yourself, so you have to allocate memory, deallocate memory, so you, you're like, I need to store 100 numbers, so I need the memory for an array of 100 numbers. I'm going to do stuff with that, and I'm going to maybe pass it to somebody else as a function. I'm going to maybe get that back as the va return value from a function. And at some point, somebody's got to like delete that memory, free that memory up so that other people can use that later if they need to. Right? That's the part of the story. Um, that turns out to be enormously difficult to do yourself by hand correctly. Like if it wasn't, you wouldn't have the 70% problem. Um, there are a lot of ways that can go wrong. Um, two common ones are, so let's say I make some memory and I'm using it and I pass it to you and I say, you can do some stuff with this if you want. And you've got it and you're like, I'm done with it. I'm going to free that memory. But you didn't tell me you were going to do that. I think that memory is still mine. Somebody else has now gotten that memory as part of an allocation event and they have I don't know, put their password in that memory. And I think I have access to that memory, but it now belongs to somebody else, but the language doesn't tell me that. So I could just like write over some stuff that you thought you owned, and that's not good, right? That can clearly be a bad thing. Um, so a lot of awkward stuff like that can happen. There's also a lot of issues with what is called aliasing, where you and I think we have different pieces of memory, but it turns out we're pointing to the same piece of memory. So we have different names for it, but those turn out to be aliases for what is the same memory in uh, the system. And so again, I think I can do what I want to with it. You think you can do what you want to with it, and we end up smashing each other badly. It's not a good thing, right? And this can lead to a lot of security issues. Um, you can gain access to memory you shouldn't have had access to and possibly read passwords or change sensitive data. Um, you can just trash memory that you shouldn't have had access to and that might not give you special permissions but you might be able to crash a service um, and if you can crash an important service that can have a significant impact on people. So there's a lot of things like that that happen. I, did that help some? Yes. Okay cool. Um, so Rust, as a language, makes a lot of these things impossible. So like the aliasing problem that I mentioned is literally impossible in Rust. Well, OK, if you really stretch and, and decide you're going to go out of your way to avoid the good features of the language, you can make some bad stuff happen. They even have a feature called unsafe code, that like unsafe is a keyword in the language. And you can mark code as being unsafe because it maybe call C code directly um, and things like that. So you can do bad stuff, but if you just program like a normal human being and don't go out of your way to be difficult, it actually protects you from all kinds of bad things. It's actually super cool that way. Um, and a lot of people are moving to Rust as an option um, in contexts where uh, a garbage collected language like Java is not really a feasible option. Okay, And I could have giving you slides of quotes about, you know, why this is cool and I'm going to not do that. So I would worked with Rust a little bit and I liked what I'd seen. Um, I liked how it addressed a hard problem that I had experienced that pain, like I cared about that problem. Um, 
And I like the way the language forced you to think about some subtle but important issues in your code. One of the things that is true in most programming languages in my experience is that you can do stupid things and the language is like, Merry Christmas, have fun. Yeah. Um, and Rust is like, no, that ain't, no, we're not doing that. Um, and so you spend a lot of time, if you're going to learn Rust, you spend a lot of time convincing the compiler that you know what you're talking about. Like you have a long conversation with the compiler about your code. Um, but if you can get past the compiler, then you're usually golden. Like one of the things that I have found is that when my co code compiles and runs, it's almost always been correct. And that's not been true in most of my other programming experience. I have had to do very little debugging um, once I can get past the compiler, which is its own thing. And you've got to be you know, good for that. But it, it's really, I think, a really wonderful thing. Um, I've given some upper level students some exposure to Rust in a lab course. They were generally pretty keen. Um, and I wanted to have a better idea of what role Rust might play in our curriculum. It seemed like a cool language. How could we be using it? Where could be using it? We could be using it in our curriculum. So what did I do? Um, I programmed live on the internet, which is just such a weird thing to say. As a 60-year-old man who, well, not quite, but nearly, uh, who didn't grow up in sort of the streaming universe, I'll program live on the internet. That's a totally normal thing for people. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so um, I started in late May doing two two-hour sessions a week. I wasn't really sure how this was going to work, and I didn't want to overcommit. Um, it worked really well over the summer. So in August, I moved to doing four two-hour sessions a week. Um, I wanted to put a little more energy into it. And doing four sessions allowed me to work on two projects in parallel, which was cool. Um, starting in March, I've scaled back to three sessions a week because we're coming up on the end of my sabbatical. I'm having to start to think about like working for a living again. And oh, it's terrible. Woe is me. Um, also, I, I have this fantasy the weather will turn good and I can work in the garden soon. And, and we're trying to expand our vegetable garden. And so I'm trying to do some things to back away a little bit. Um, I started by doing the rustlings exercises. And if you're interested in rust, I highly recommend these. These are the best of their sort that I've ever run into. It's a set of 94 exercises that walk you through the key features of the language with pointers back to resources to give you more information. They're just really, really good. Um, and it took seven two-hour sessions for me to get through the whole thing. Now, I wasn't trying to race through them. I was, this was a learning exercise for me. So I, would, I did some of these exercises two, three, four times. People on the stream would make suggestions and be like, oh, you could try using this tool or this technique. And be like, oh, I didn't even know that existed. Let's try that out. Um, and this works, but I think it's ugly. Can we make it less ugly? I need to read the internet for a second. Sorry, people. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't trying to race through them. I was trying to, like, be thoughtful. And again, this was one of the things that being online arguably helped with. I think if I'd been on my own, I probably would have cheaped out a little more. But knowing that there were people watching helped and, and, and like asking questions and providing responses really did help me, I think, stay um, focused on what I was doing and try to do good stuff. Um, since then, I've gone on to a whole bunch of other projects. We don't need to talk about all of these. But just to give you a sense, um, I've done some web app stuff. U is a library that's similar to React. It compiles to WebAssembly. Um, uh, I've done some system labs. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working on an evolutionary computation framework. That's my research area. Um, and the system I've been working with for like the last almost decade is written in Clojure. Um, based on some early data, the Rust version seems to be maybe 50 to 100 times faster than the Clojure version. Um, so things that would take a week might take two hours. And this is really going to, I mean, if we can make this work, this is like, whoa, very cool. Um, since January, I've been working on advent of code problems, um, which is a great set of problems if you're interested. 
Um, uh, I think that the advent of code things are easier for the audience in some ways because you can come in, watch a problem, leave, miss a week or three, come back, you've got a new problem. Um, whereas the evolution of code stuff, the design of that system is pretty complicated, and I think it's a little tricky sometimes to hop in and out of. Um, but it's, you know, good work. Written some 6,000 lines. It's probably quite a bit more than that because, again, I delete things and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and over 600 commits uh, on just these projects. Well, my gear, pretty much what I'm using today, like this laptop, um, uh, which provides the camera and the mic. Um, uh, I've got a second screen. Um, uh, for a while before that screen arrived, I was actually using an iPad in sidecar mode as my second screen. If you're going to stream, it's useful to have a second screen because you want to have the screen that's got the Twitch software on it and then the thing you're actually sharing with people, um, uh, which is part of why Charlo's like watching the Twitch over there because I can't do that here. Um, the external mic that I have is entirely optional. I've used it sometimes. I haven't used it other times. Um, I just have been using the Twitch Studio software. Um, I think the, the thing real people use is OBS. And OBS had a lot of knobs and dials. And I went, I don't think I want to do all that. Um, and uh, Twitch Studio was like, push a button. It will work. I'm like, thumbs up. Um, uh, I think, and again, at the beginning, I had no idea if I was going to do this for more than 10 minutes, so I was trying to be as lightweight as possible. And if it hasn't broken, I mostly left it alone. Um, just using the home Wi-Fi, I think if I was going to make one change, it would probably be to run an Ethernet cable up. Um, but that involves drilling some holes and some walls and floors and things. And But it probably would. There have been a couple of times where the audio has been out of sync with the video and some things like that. And I think that... Ethernet would pro direct Ethernet would probably help a lot. How did it go? It has been awesome. Um, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in Rust at this point, but man, have I made a lot of progress. I have climbed much of a hill, um, and it has been really, really good. I definitely feel ready to teach this material in classes, which that's my job, and so that's really the goal for me in a lot of ways, and I feel like I've made an enormous amount of progress on that front. Um, it has absolutely provided focus and accountability. I've done 102 episodes now, so that's this is episode 103 of Unhindered by Coding. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, so that's over 200 hours of time absolutely focused, not going to the bathroom, not surfing the internet, not going and getting a snack, not doing all the things that we do when we think we're working, right? Um, uh, absolutely, you know, focused on programming. Time spent prepping. Um, I take notes at the end. Usually I spend half an hour to an hour actually taking notes after a two-hour session. Um, so I have some memory. Because, you know, going back and rewatching the videos, I've got them all, but mm, that's not going to happen. Um, uh, so I want to have notes about what happened. Um, uh, end up doing homework, like somebody will mention, oh, hey, this would be a cool library. I'm like, okay, don't have time right now to figure out where that sits, but I'll make a note and go do some homework later. So I probably got four to 500 hours of actual time in on this project over the course of the year. Um, and I've had so much help from the people online. I mean, that's the part I really just, it's very hard to uh, describe how helpful that they've been. Um, asking great questions, making suggestions. Um, they've really been wonderful. Um, and as an example, and unfortunately you folks aren't going to be able to see this, but uh, if the picture of me in the corner, I'm, literally my head is exploding. I'm just like, oh my god! Um, that's about a week ago. Um, and uh, there's a particular problem that has come up in the evolution of computation work a number of times where the compiler's unhappy and the error message, generally the Rust error messages are super useful. That's, it's one of the most amazing things about the language. But there's this one place where the messages are totally unhelpful um, for me. And I keep making that mistake. And then the message doesn't tell me anything. It's like, oh my god, I don't know what to do. Um, and one of the viewers was like, hey, try rewriting the line this way. And I think it might improve the error messages. Angels sang. It was, if I, oh, yeah, it was great. It was a wonderful thing. Um, 
And this is an example, but this has been really the whole year. It's been just people sharing great ideas and helping me be less stupid, which is really good because I'm good at being stupid. It's sort of nice having help. So um, some stats. Again, sorry to those over there. Um, it's really a shame that screen doesn't work. Um, but this is uh, total minutes viewed. So, so far there have been 33,000 minutes watched over the course of the year, um, which I, it's a very strange number. That's hard to think about. And you can see that it's sort of gen generally going up as more people have, have stumbled in. Um, almost 900 unique viewers. Now, that sounds impressive, but actually most of those people probably came for two minutes and said, man, this is boring, and left. And they still get counted, and that's cool. I mean, I'm, you know, it, it's, it's like minibar. Leave if it's not working for you. Um, but 117 follows and 72 unique people have taken time to write a comment, right? And that's really cool. So um, I've been very, very pleased with this outcome. Um, surprised. Um, this is a word cloud, again, sorry to the left, um, uh, uh, from the chat transcripts from basically the second half of the experience. I didn't actually think to save the chat transcripts at the beginning. That, I, uh, that only occurred to me later on. Um, uh, so this is not everything. Um, Rust obviously appears very prominently. That's no big surprise. Um, there's a lot of Rust concepts in here, um, so Rust keywords, data types like VAC, uh, concepts like closure. So you can see there's been a lot of discussion of Rust stuff in the chat. Um, there's a lot of evolutionary computation stuff because I've been working on that project a lot. Um, so there are a lot of terms that are specific to evolutionary computation in that. And there's a lot of just human people having conversations. So hello. And a lot of things about thinking and ideas and guessing. Like So you can kind of see the problem solving wheels here. Um, and then people just being nice, saying thank you. That's cool. I like that. Um, I want to thank a few particular people in the stream that have been, I mean, and there's so many people I could talk about. It's very like, uh, but Izitsu has been uh, with me almost from the beginning and has been super engaged uh, all the way through, has provided a huge number of ideas, and has been super patient. Zitz has got a lot more experience with Rust than I do. Zitz has been working on it in it for like five years. And Zitz would say things like, I think we should do blah. And I'd be like, I don't understand why we would do that. That seems overly complicated. I'm not sure what the point is. So I'd be like, okay, I'm going to do it my way. And I'd go off to do my thing, and we'd wander over here, and we'd amble over there. And then, of course, we'd end up exactly where Zitzu said we were going to be. Um, and Zitzu's sitting there patiently on the bench waiting for me to arrive um, and has never been, you know, uh, I see, I told you so, right? So it's been really, really cool. Um, uh, we got this provided a lot of cool ideas from functional programming. Um, Ike Kapoor has shared a lot on the Discord. Uh, Nathaniel Bumpo has shared a lot of interesting algorithmic ideas and how those connect to Rust. Uh, Mizzard X provided the uh, mind-blowing uh, suggestion uh, last week. Uh, there's a concept called raids in uh, uh, Twitch where you can, at the end of your stream, bring a bunch of people to another stream. Um, Corey Ja has raided a couple times and brought some people in, and that's cool. And then just so many other people that have uh, been helpful, been consistent, um, and have made it a good experience for me. And I really appreciate all of you. Thank you. Um, so I do want to say, like, this has worked really well for me, but I'm not here to say it would work really well for everybody. I mean, I definitely bring some advantages to this. I have a lot of years of teaching experience. I'm used to talking about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right? People are watching you program. That could be like one of the most boring activities in the universe. Right? And so you have to say, what, what, what am I working on? How am I stuck? What am I confused about? What's my goal? Like Being able to say things like that is helpful. And I've done that because I've programmed in front of students for years. Right? So I've got practice doing that. I'm sort of used to just being quiet and thinking for a second in front of people. Not as good at that as I'd like to be, but you know, teaching has helped with that. Um, I've had experience teaching online because COVID. Um, and so I had the basic gear was all there. I didn't have to buy anything 
to try this. I was able to do all this with stuff I had in the house at the moment. And I've actually worked on three college radio stations over a period of like 40 years. Um, and one thing that's useful there is you're used to talking and not seeing your audience. Because it's, it is weird to have a conversation when you have no idea if there's anyone out there or who's out there or what they care about. And so having that radio experience was probably pretty helpful. Okay. Um, I'm a middle-aged white guy who looks like he ought to be programming, um, right? People don't look at me and go, what are you doing writing computer programs, right? And that's, that's real, right? That's a thing. Um, uh, and it also, there's confidence that comes with that um, because I'm used to doing that and being seen in that way, right? And that's, that's a real thing. Um, I've taught myself a lot of things, including a lot of programming languages over the many years. And so it gives one confidence that this might like work out. I had the sabbatical time to put into this, right? There, there were a lot of hours there. Not everybody's got those kind of hours. Um, and so I'm very grateful to the university for, you know, making that possible. Um, and I wasn't out anything if it flopped, right? I could try it, play around for a couple of weeks. If nobody showed up, I thought the whole thing was dumb. I could have just walked away and I don't lose anything. Um, so not everybody's going to be in that position. Maybe you've got more eggs in that basket than I had. Um, I picked a good thing to learn. Um, Rust is hot, so there was a lot of interest. It's challenging, but it was doable. Um, there were good projects to start with, like Rustlings. Um, and I had a lot of things I could apply to it. Um, I think you can do it, too, if you wanted to. Um, it takes time, but it certainly has paid off for me, and I hope to continue how that's going to look when I actually have to start like showing up for work, I don't know. Um, but I'm hoping to do at least one, maybe two sessions a week. Um, we'll see. Uh, my wife keeps looking at me like, really? You think that's going to happen? Um, and I'm like, well, uh. um, it's easiest if the activity is already on a computer, right? The, the, the system's just going to be simpler if you're doing something that's on a computer, but it doesn't have to be programming. It could be photo or video or audio editing, productivity stuff, design stuff. I mean, anything on a computer where you've got projects you want to do and there might be people that can help you with those, I think is a candidate. Um, with more gear, you could go out into the world, right? You would need more and different cameras, you might need to get lighting, you're probably going to need different mics, right? So it gets more complicated if you want to do a cooking show on, on Twitch, but it's possible, right? There's nothing inherently impossible about it, it's just it would take more um, effort. It's probably useful if people can jump in and out of whatever you're doing. That's one of the downsides, I think, of the evolution of computation project, is it's big enough and complicated enough that I think there are people that come in and go, I think I'm interested in this, but I just can't get my head around what's, what you're doing. And then they end up sort of leaving. And, but it's something I want to keep working on. So yeah, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, so uh, hopefully we have time for Q. We do. Good. Yay. Um, uh, thank you very much for being here. Remember that we're streaming when we get into the questions. Um, so Maggie and Charlotte have been tracking things. Um, I want to thank all the streaming folks again um, and the university for the sabbatical and thanks to all of you and the mini far folks for like making this possible. Um, so we got time. What would you like to talk about, if anything? So we could talk about Rust. We could talk about the streaming. We could talk about where lunch is. You know, I, I, I'm good. So um, yes, ma'am. Question about your presence online. Before you embarked on this, what was your Twitter presence, like, did, or your Twitch presence, did you have a community? And, like, did you share this to other online communities, or kind of how, where did your audience come from? Great question. Absolutely great question. I had never used Twitch before. Um, I used Twitch because I heard young, cool people say that word a lot, and I decided <laughs> that was probably the thing to do. Um, <laughs> I confirmed with our 29-year-old child that Twitch was hip and that I should do that. Um, uh, I had, so I'd never used it. Um, there are other streaming options. You could certainly stream on uh, YouTube easily, for example. Um, but it seemed like Twitch was where the cool kids hung out, so uh, I went with that. Um, I did almost no advertising. So I... 
Uh, I'm on Twitter. I don't have a ton of followers. I don't use it very actively, even less so these days. Um, I don't know why that would be, but um, uh, but I so I would go on Twitter and be like, I'm about to be on the internet programming. If you want to come, um, and that was really about all the advertising I did. I told I I, I said something about it on some places where some of the students and alum are um, in computer science. Um, but most everybody who came to the stream and has been really engaged found it through Twitch. Like they saw the keyword Rust. So I made an effort to like put in keywords and things that would make it sort of search friendly on Rust. And I think most of them found it just by going to Twitch and seeing Rust and saying, oh, I'll see what this guy is doing with Rust. Um, so I did not put any real effort into I didn't bring an audience with me, and I didn't do a lot of audience explicit audience building, partly because it's just not my style, but partly because I knew it was going to probably end. Like if this was going to be my gig in a real way, I would. There's a number of things I would be doing differently, including you know promotion. But since you know, I figure in a few months this is going to trickle down to you know a little stream. Um, I didn't want to get too invested in that kind of stuff. Um, so, I, very little. It's a short version. So, yes, sir. I just wanted to give a second. Like, I, I, I've streamed on Twitch exactly twice. Okay. Uh, my mom was stuck in uh, Philadelphia because of some airline problems. She was really bummed out. So, I created a Twitch account so I could stream myself playing chess and just failing constantly. And she thought that was hilarious. <laughs> uh, but then I had that Twitch up and a uh, coworker of mine was on some game clothes. So I took all of her game photos and I just was like, hey, you know what? I'm editing these. I'm on my computer anyway. Here's Twitch. And I sent her a link and I kept on editing these. And uh, a couple other friends came up to, to watch and that was an uh, interesting experience. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I hadn't thought about I mean, Twitch is primarily a gaming platform. I hadn't thought about board games like chess. I mean, it's mostly sort of video gaming. It's huge for, for chess is huge. On oh, is it really? Well, see, there you go. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. A lot of things got po weird. Things got popular during the <laughs> I mean, things got popular during the pandemic. So, so uh, you brought a lot to Twitch from the classroom. I'm yeah. wondering. Do you have anything from your Twitch experience you're going to bring back? That's a great question. Um, oh, I should be repeating the questions. I, the people online may have no idea what I'm handling that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Charlo, you're awesome. Um, so lots of classroom stuff came to Twitch. What from Twitch is going back to the classroom? Um, I think so there's a whole lot of possible answers. One is. I know Rust better than I did before, and that's going to go back to the classroom. So that, it, in a very simplistic way, is an answer. Um, it is useful as a faculty member to remember what it is to be confused. Um, when you've been teaching as long as I have, I, there are some things I've now taught for longer than my students have been alive. <laughs> <laughs> things you didn't need to say out loud in public. But, um, and so it can be hard to remember how confusing things can be when you're first getting started. And so forcing myself, allowing myself, however you want to phrase it, to be, to learn something new that's hard and confusing and to be confused in front of other people is, I think, something every teacher ought to do more often than we probably do because we usually don't have time or circumstances or courage for it. But I think that's actually, I mean, how that actually manifests itself in the room, I don't know. But remembering that feeling and knowing what that's like for students, I think is just a really important thing. Um, and so that's certainly been a value. Um, I have... Students often come to me and say, hey, I'm going to have time this summer. I want to learn a thing. Um, that's me telling me that I have five minutes left. Um, I just wanted to make sure, as a faculty member, we talk a lot. A lot and I was just figured I'd blow right through the end um, and keep everybody from lunch, and that would make me sad. Um, so they'll come and be like, I want to learn Python. And I'm like, great. I think you should totally learn Python. 
And then they're like, now what do I do? I'm like, well, learn Python, right? And, <laughs> and if you're old, you buy a book. Uh, that's what us old people do. If you're not old, you find resources online. And they're like, but yeah, right? And, and then it almost never happens, like because the, the accountability problem kicks in. Um, they have the, all the right intentions, but the follow through is really tr tricky. And so having done this, now I'm going to have a new thing I can potentially suggest. Are many students going to say, oh yeah, I totally, I'll just learn Python by, on Twitch and people will watch and that'll be okay and I've got the courage to do that. That I don't know, right? That's a, a more complicated problem. But it also makes me think that maybe things like this, and we've, we've done some things in the past where we've had dojos on campus where people come and sort of group program on problems. And one thing this experience has suggested is that we should maybe be going back to that and doing more of that. That there could be ways in which that would be a, a good thing that I, I we kind of let, in COVID times and stuff, a lot of that stuff got dropped. And I think this has encouraged me to think more about that sort of stuff as a tool moving forward. So those would be some things. I don't know if that helped. So in the back, you had your hand up. Um, oh, oh. Question from the chat. Okay. I, uh, this is SIFTD. How important has the Discord been providing a sense of permanence to the community? Interesting question. So there is a Discord server. Um, I think the Discord has been useful. I don't have personally the sense that it's been like vital. I mean, I think having some place where you can talk offline is a good thing, and I would probably recommend it. But, um, and there have definitely been some important conversations that have happened there, but I think had Discord not existed, we still probably would have gotten more or less the same place, I think. If people online feel differently, you should definitely share that. So, um, is there anybody else online with anything, or is that? No, I'm monitoring. Okay. So, in the back. Um, there's a popular Twitch event that students have done called Twitch Pokemon. Essentially, they have the Twitch hive mind, the Twitch chat, input um, votes in order to control the players ah. in the Pokemon video game sure. and try to play through the uh, Pokemon game and complete it. Now, I'm curious maybe if they took rustling, like yeah, yeah. programming problem, and had the Twitch hive mind try to complete those problems, what are some of the challenges that you could foresee the Twitch? Oh, well, that's a that's a fascinating question. Um, well, I think with anything, part of the problem is is going to be: Are you working in the same direction, or you're working at cross purposes? There are lots of different ways to solve this part of the game, or solve this part of the programming problem. And if you've got people pointed in a direction, then it probably is great. And if people are pointed in wildly different directions, it's probably chaos. And if you've ever worked on a team, for example, you may have had similar experiences. And so I think that would be the hardest thing, um, would be simply sort of reaching some kind of agreement on which way we were going with it. But it would be possible. I don't see why it couldn't happen. Um, so it's a cool idea. Um, yeah? Uh, do you have any idea what um, people that follow you are getting out of the system? I have never asked. I've, I've, I've tried very hard to not be, like, pushy slash super inquisitive. Like, these people are doing me this awesome favor of being there and giving me their time. And, and, and I'm not, like, my mom can sit down with you for half an hour and she knows your whole life story. I can sit down for half an hour with you and we can have, have a nice time. Um, but I'm not going to know your whole life story. I, that's not my thing. And so I know a little bit, like many of these people, I don't know where they are physically. I know from some time zone conversations that Izitsu's in the UK and Wagafa's in Sweden um, uh, and Justice is in Germany. Um, so I know a couple of people, like where they are. That's really about as far, and I can infer a few things. Some people are like, oh, I got to go take a work call. So they're probably not college students. Um, uh, one person's 18, so that probably tells us some things. Um, but I don't know very much about these people other than they're awesome. Because um, uh, I have not sort of tried to dig into that because that doesn't seem to be my, you know, gig. So, um, 
Yeah, um, even though the really like live streaming may not be everyone's thing, do you think there's a benefit of joining a live stream who is trying to learn to code? And given that you've learned so many programming languages in the past, would you have chosen like joining someone else's stream as a way of learning, or would you have chosen to replace? So I'm a firm believer in the need to do the work and interact with the material. I think you can read all you want, you can watch people do it, but you have to ultimately sit down and type at the keyboard and fight the monster. There is no other way, in, you know, in my however many years of doing this, I don't have any way to get good at this except for doing the, the work, which is like a sport. Like, you can't get good at pole vaulting by reading about pole vaulting. You've got to, like, run and fall and run and fall and do the stuff. Or playing the flute or the oboe, right? I can read all the oboe books in the world, and I'm still not going to make a noise when I pick up an oboe, right? So I think that if you've had streamers that were doing things you found interesting and that that has value for you, absolutely. I watch a lot of YouTube videos on Rust stuff, um, and I've learned a lot from doing that. But it's typically been kind of like higher order conceptual stuff not the detail. I, I never could have learned to program in Rust by watching YouTube videos. I don't think that's how it happens. It happens by going ah! um, <coughs> on the computer. And yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, so if it works for you, great. But I don't think it could be the only thing that you do if you want to learn to program. I think there's got to be the mm, fight with it. So somebody else. Yes. First off, you got a new problem. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> my, my computer made little following noises several times, so but I greatly appreciate it. It's you and anybody else that followed. So yes, go ahead. Uh, my question is, um, during you know this year process of coding, um, what was the most challenging thing that you went through while like you know because the thing is you have to kind of well I'm not sure whether that was retention or not was like entertain yeah. you know, people that are there at the same time. Uh, trying to do things or like right. Well, so it's interesting that you use the word entertain. If I have been entertaining it all online, that's an accident and not <laughs> by design. Um, I mean, I really don't. There are streamers that are very into performance, like they've got their memes and their backgrounds and their stuff. I am sitting in a dumpy little room upstairs. I didn't do a green screen. You're seeing like piles of paper and random crap in the background. Um, I mean, I really did not do this right for, you know, uh, in terms of a lot of conceptions of what right would be. Um, and I'm mostly, I'm just like, hey, we're here. Let's do this thing. And oddly enough, that works for people. Um, what has I found difficult? I think the embarrassment of being really lost in front of people is probably the hardest thing. Um, and that is, I think that's a thing we all experience, like being really, really lost on some, you know, and if I wasn't online, a lot of these times I would just been like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm completely baffled. I'm just gonna walk away and I'll think about it later and come back to it. But there I am and I'm an hour into the stream and we've got a compiler error that I do not have any idea what to do about, and there are people watching. That is probably the hardest, been the, the hardest thing, is pushing through there and not saying, I cancel, I quit, I'm done, right? I, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to this next time after I've had a chance to think about it. Um, uh, and so I think that's probably been the most difficult thing. Um. I've had uh, thoughts about like the Rust community. Talk about the Twitch people. Yeah. Do the Rust people like talk to you, acknowledge you, know you exist, or are you like an ambassador for them? Well, <laughs> so I probably a bit of the latter. I mean, like right now, right? I, without them being aware of it, um, I, the people that come to the stream, some of them really know Rust very well. So, like Azitsu, Nathaniel Bumpo, Justice, these people know Rust way better than I do, right? Um, uh, but there are people that come to the stream that don't know Rust at all, and will ask, like, so how do you feel about this? Has this been good learning this? Like, and so we'll end up having a half-hour chat about 
my experience with Rust so far, which is a short, less organized version of this. Um, and uh, so there's been some of that. I have not made any particular effort to tell the Rust community that I exist. Again, I've not been doing a lot of advertising because I don't see this as a long-term gig. Um, I have posted some questions and things on the Rust users forum, and, and I've gotten answers very quickly. Um, we got stuck on one thing, and I posted uh, a question and got an answer like by the end of the day that totally clarified what was going on for me. Um, so they've been helpful, but I haven't made any effort to like tell them that I'm trying to accomplish anything on their behalf or anything like that. Um, so that, does that answer the right question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned there was a 50 to 100 times speed up. Yeah. Uh, for us. I was kind of curious. So that's insane for stuff, but I was curious. Um, if there's any features that Rust gave you that allowed you to do things that you might have wanted to do in Clojure but wasn't possible, like if there's any new things that you could incorporate just as a feature of the language? Well, I think that, so, hmm, that's a great question. Um, and, and if people need to leave, it's six minutes after 12, lunch has begun, pizza is available, so I don't want to hold people here. Um, what? Oh. So, um, I think that a, a significant part of the performance advantage that we're seeing is in not having the garbage collector. I don't know that for sure. Um, I, I really want to get farther along uh, on the Rust code so that I can be doing a slightly more apples and apples comparison. but. The memory footprint of the closure system is like a thousand times bigger than the memory footprint, foot, foot, footprint of the Rust system. And I think that has got to matter a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, maybe not quite, but it's between 100 and 1,000 times bigger. And you know, you get the whole JVM closure sitting on top. Like, there's a big runtime there, right? Um, and so that's some of it. But, but also, I think you're just allocating a huge amount of memory on the heap and rust is doing a lot less of that in, in a much more controlled way and so I think that's part of it um, you know I don't think there's anything I think the 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 closure code frankly is easier to write and probably easier to make sense of in some ways um, but I think the the rust code has forced me to think about the design way more. The closure code was just like banged together by a bunch of people over a period of years. And really, there's very little design to be found in it. Um, there's some, but it, not much. Um, whereas the, the Rust code has really forced me to think about the design of the system in a very intentional way. One of the things that I found really interesting about Rust is I think Rust more than any language I've worked in, and I've worked in a lot, causes me to use like all of the computer science parts of my brain. Like closure and, and Haskell, I almost feel like a mathematician who just happened to bump into a computer in a, at a party. Um, and then C, you're like a hardware person that happened to write some code, right? But there doesn't have to be any computer science in it. And, Rust really makes me think about computer science in a lot of ways. And this is one of the things, I mean, your question about what comes back to the classroom, and I'm still struggling. I can say those words, but I don't know what those mean in terms of like how that changes what's going to happen in the classroom for me. But I do feel that somewhere in there, there is a really neat way of thinking about computer science as a field that Rust helps me feel and understand in some cool ways. And I really want to be able to say that better and know what that means in a, in a classroom setting. Um, but I think there's something really cool there. And I don't think it's something I've seen people talk about a whole lot. I think that the people in the Rust community would know would recognize that if I said it in front of them, but I don't think it's something I've seen explicitly 
written about or talked about very much. And I think there's something there, but I don't know quite how to make it happen yet. One of those little challenges in life. Other questions? Okay, we should go have lunch. Oh, is there anything? Are we good? Okay. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Enjoy Mini Bar. It's awesome. Thank you, people online. You were amazing. Really appreciate it. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. So I'm going to stop the stream now. Blah, blah, blah. End stream. End recording.